You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon, and on today's episode, we have Thomas Halvidel, the co-founder and head of sales and marketing at Akono. They are a company that was founded in 2015 with a product portfolio of different sensors and beacon solutions for various IoT and Industry 4.0 applications, uh, as well as development of custom uh, customized hardware products. They work with various different partners to build end-to-end solutions such as indoor navigation, asset tracking, condition monitoring, and many more. A fantastic company, great people there too. Um, Thomas and many of the other people I spoke with were, were wonderful. Um, on this episode, we cover a lot about uh, different topics. We talk about challenges in the IoT space, challenges with the hardware, um, talking about the standards in, in IoT and kind of how they play a role. We also talk about the role hardware companies play in IoT in general. Um, sensor types, process for building versus buying off the shelf, kind of how to approach that decision-making process, how to approach that buying process, um, and also partnering versus building everything in-house yourself and kind of the pros and cons to both of those. So great episode, you'll get a lot of value out of it. But before we get into this episode, I want you to take what you know about IoT and expand it by a factor of a thousand. That's what our sponsor for this episode, Impinge, is doing. With the Impinge platform, everything can be connected, from strawberries to supply chains, from IV bags to inventory. Impinge is creating the internet of every little thing. To learn more, go to impinge.com slash IFA. That's Impinge with a J, I-M-P-I-N-J dot com slash IFA to learn more. And without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the IoT for All podcast. Welcome, Thomas, to the IoT for All podcast. Thanks for being here this week. Hey, thanks for, for having me and uh, glad to be here. Yeah, it's fantastic to have you on as a guest. I wanted to start off by having you give a quick introduction about yourself to our audience. Yes, uh, thank you. So uh, I'm I'm Thomas, uh, 47 years old by tomorrow, and oh, nice. uh, have a long uh, background actually in telecommunications and in, in consulting. And at one point, you know, we were fiddling with hardware and experimenting, and uh, I was uh, so curious about IoT and you know how mobile actually conquers the world that uh, we found at Econo, right? and uh, that's where I am today and I'm more on the marketing side so I'd like to you know understand more the uh, business challenges and see how we can match them with technology to mm-hmm. find solutions right so more in in the area where innovation happens you could say well first off happy early birthday and um, I wanted to ask so tell us a little bit more about Akano and kind of what you all focus on, the role you all play in IoT and, and things like that. Yeah. So Akono is, uh, is six years old, right? So uh, uh, we still sometimes say startup because hardware tends to have longer cycles, but uh, we're actually quite established by now. Um, originally, we founded Akono with the idea to help companies uh, having better tools to create IoT uh, showcases and use cases. So we had a development board, a programmer, uh, the fitting uh, communication modules, uh, a big pile of code for that, right? And, uh, you know, it was kind of position between an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi, right? Mm. And that, that, that was how we started and then it came differently. And when you were starting the company, what opportunity do you really see in the market? Tell us a little bit more about that founding story. I always think that's super fascinating to talk about. Actually, I was uh, at a a big telco company and um, we were doing a lot of things for both smart home, but also smart manufacturing and industry for that now. And it was early days, you know, and you could see how um, the ideas were there, right, to use sensors, to measure vibrations, to go to predictive maintenance. But doing that was so difficult. You know, you started fiddling with Arduino and then you, you built a tower of, uh, of, uh, of things and that was so far away from, from products. And then we had the idea to, well, create this, this, this platform that would fit in the middle. And when you, where you are now, talk about some of the use cases or areas that you have focus, you focus on as from a, from a kind of vertical standpoint. So what we've come to actually, when we started with this development board and things, uh, the industry actually has quickly asked us whether we could also uh, produce and deliver full sensor systems, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that is actually... That's the two things we do today. We have a platform uh, on uh, on tools and and uh, uh, hardware, you know, like from battery all the way up to different sensors, uh, the computing, right, and how we can uh, manufacture systems for our customers. But we also have a range of uh, own uh, sensor beacons uh, that we produce in in scale, right, and uh, these are then used in. 
uh, and all sorts of different industries. You know, there's not this one one thing, but we're in healthcare, but we're also in logistics, right? We have use cases right. in automotive and in okay. heavy industry, right? And when you're um, working with organizations on the, the kind of the hardware process for, for them, what, what how would how do you kind of describe to them the role that hardware and just generally hardware companies are playing in the kind of development of their solution and the success of their deployments? Hmm. Um, well, it's uh, sometimes it's very easy. You know, people tend to come more to us with an idea. So uh, very recently we had an agricultural company um, with an idea for predictive maintenance sensor, mm. right? And they normally are very far away from electronics and, and uh, IoT in that sense, right? But they had a very good understanding of what they uh, what they wanted to have, right? So they wanted to understand how the product is used uh, and, and uh, know, uh, how long it is used and in, in what conditions, right? And uh, we would then uh, turn to them and say, like, how can we help designing a system, designing the hardware, right, to measure what they need to find out, right? So operating times, operating speeds, vibrations, vibration peaks, right? So mm. we're not only doing the hardware, there, we're actually creating the system, right? So it's right. the hardware, but also the firmware that runs on the chip, right? So we right. can look into the magnetic field and understand how that is spinning. And from that, we can calculate you, uh, your rotational speed, for example. And when you're in these conversations, are, is this all the data that you're collecting? This is the, the focus is really to help kind of pair them with the right type of sensor uh, for their deployment? Yeah, actually, that's in most cases, the customers have a very uh, specific idea on business and what they want to find out. But then okay. it's a question of, can it be done, right? And uh, right. how accurate can it be done, right? So we typically start with experiments and later end with a full design and customer design product. And when you're having that conversation, I know a lot of times a big point with when it comes to selecting the correct hardware is being able to buy off the shelf versus kind of going that custom route, like building something from scratch. How is that conversation usually handled? And how do you kind of advise companies that are maybe listening to this to kind of be thinking about that decision? Yeah, oh, that, that's, a, that's a very good one. You know, everything that is custom, 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 yeah. typically tends to be expensive, right? Expensive sure. in design and making and maintaining, right? And it's simply not a route we recommend to go, right? Okay. Um, when we talk about custom designs, what we actually have is we have something uh, that we would call uh, the Acono Base, which is like our toolkit, right? So we know a variety of sensors. We have all the, the code, the drivers and things with this ready. And uh, with every every design we do, this platform actually grows, right? So uh, we can uh, recombine our standard products okay. and turn them into more custom products. So this is then more economically effective, right? Uh, it scales with the other products and it's, it's not a full custom design, but it's, let's say, adapting to your needs more in terms of really having a full custom design. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I, I'm, it's always interesting when I talk to companies because there are many different viewpoints when it comes to customization versus off the shelf. Obviously, off the shelf, if you get into market faster, it's going to be most likely cheaper, but there are pieces to some unique use cases and applications that do require certain components to be included in the hardware in order for it to even be plausible for them to deploy. So the right connectivity, the, the form factor of it, how does it handle certain elements, things like that. And, and that, 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 that's exactly it. Like the typical use case, for example, is to measure vibration, right? Okay. So a system that measures vibrations, we have, right? That's kind of off the shelf. Right. And we know how to set different thresholds, right? So do you want to react on, on, on uh, low impulse and high impulse? We can right. wake up when something happens and, and, and sleep and optimize battery. But then the customer may want to have that over long distance. So yeah. you would include uh, LoRa or narrowband IoT, right? Um, sometimes people want to have um, a higher sample rate, right? Um, but on proximity. So that is kind of the customization we then really do around these things that can be from housing from battery right but it's uh it normally starts with something we have right yep. and uh, that's what we feel like we can help companies we don't want to you know go into into full redesign or creation of something sure. uh, where we cannot leverage the space we have because that would not right. be effective for the customer
And when we're talking kind of end-to-end solutions, um, where the hardware kind of fits in, what are the other pieces, like as far as the software side, the user interface side, are those things you all are doing in-house or is those things you're partnering with companies in order to kind of deploy? Well, we, we're very standards driven, right? So uh, our our vision and our mission is to deliver you that data you need, right? Mm. And that data sometimes can be a bit uh, pre-processed, right? But uh, the idea is you turn the data into information. You have your cloud, Okay. Right, when, whether you run it in AWS, in Azure, or, or whatever you use, right. we are getting the data to you, right? So right. from generating to delivery. Okay. And yes, it can be pre-processed. So we have uh, on our system uh, uh, the opportunity to um, do some edge computing, right? Because maybe you don't want to have all the data, right? But only specific values, right? So we can also do that. Yep. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Um, I want to transition here a second and talk a little bit about the challenges that you all see in the space and probably connect this a little bit more, obviously, to the hardware side. When you're talking with customers, what are some of the biggest challenges that either they are coming to the table with that you all have encountered and um, kind of talk us through what those challenges look like? Well, uh, one turn of often is time. You know, people want everything now and immediately, sure. right? And um uh, the other challenge often is, can it be done, right? A lot of the mm-hmm. questions uh, we receive are, are first-time uh, solving, uh, first-time problem solvings, right? Um, so what we try to do together with the customers to uh, focus on the key on the key issue, on the key problem, right? right. And uh, try to make experiments where we can really say, like, we can't get you that data. And only once we can really prove you, we can generate that data, then we would go into the development of the full system, right? And uh, right. that may sometimes take a bit longer, but it, you know, you don't have avoided, uh, how does it, you don't waste your money, right? Because it's nice when you have a full system, but if it later doesn't really do what you want it to do, um, it's, it will be silly, right? So uh, sure. um, that, that's one key aspect. And the, the other thing that is a pain for us is, um, as much as we like standards, uh, there are not uh, standards for all the things, right? So, for example, how do you communicate uh, a temperature value, right? How do you mm-hmm. communicate the vibration value, right? So, uh, um, there are no standards on, on uh, how these things are being communicated between different systems. So, we try to have at least uh, our way of communicating open, right, that we can... Uh, integrate with uh, with others, right? But I think there's uh, a lot of more standard work needed on the sure. overall IoT world. Yeah, it, it's interesting because when we're thinking about the hardware piece of the process for IoT deployments, it usually is much harder than people expect. I think most people think they're going to come into this, it's going to be super cheap, super easy, and they're going to be able to be up and running in a day or so. So I think how do you all approach those conversations when you are like the educational component of this, when companies come in with maybe misaligned expectations, how do you handle that kind of conversation? And, and what do you kind of advise companies to be thinking about going into that? Well, we try to be very transparent in terms of how we design products. Okay. Right. And uh, we typically work on, on time and material base when we design uh, for customers. Right. And uh, uh, we try to, but make a make a very strong plan up front in terms of what efforts uh, we think are needed, right? And um, yeah, that's always a discussion because later you have certification and these things where you feel like they don't add much value, but they cost a lot, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, th- those are often then really debated with us whether we really need that. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is really a conversational uh, process because uh, you're, you're right, a lot of people, you know, hardware and so many issues it's so cheap or vastly available when it comes to uh, standard things that uh, people never experience how much effort really it is to design hardware. You know, you you first build a small PCB, you want it fast, just that small PCB can, right. uh, you know, cost you a lot of money and then you assemble it by hand, right, and test it, right? And it's later, you know, when it, you're in mass production, that really scales, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, designing often is... Uh, uh, yeah, it's underestimated in terms of effort and, 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 and cost, I think. And, and the more specific you need it, the, uh, yeah, the, the more expensive it can actually be. 
and, and if we were to kind of pull ourselves out of just the hardware component here for a second, where else are you seeing kind of the biggest need for, or I guess the biggest challenges that companies come across or are facing in the IoT space when it comes to adoption, when it comes to deployments, getting through pilot stage? Where do you all kind of either run into them either yourself or just kind of seen from, from an onlooker standpoint some of the bigger challenges in the space? Well, uh, sometimes I really think it's uh, people have a lot of ideas, mm. right? And uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, drive for innovation in companies. Um, but uh, some people are not having the uh, the belief in themselves to really bring products to market, right? And, and to uh, to change, right? And uh, uh, as an example, we are working with a, a German company that is uh, very high-end specialized in uh, fabrication of uh, tank systems, right? So mm -hmm. they have uh, uh, double solid welded uh, extra thick tank walls, right? And right. Uh, um, so that's super. But now they go into IoT and we are developing a smart fueling system. And the developers they have are eventually from the COBOL days. It's almost like uh, uh, they, they are so far away from anything that's web or software as a service or so. Right? And all that uh, uh, digitalization in the, in, in the wider fields, you know, thinking about uh, what is the next digital level for your product, uh, that thinking is... Uh, uh, that that needs to develop much much more, and we need to have many many more skilled people uh, right. to to help all these companies getting there. Right. So totally. And when it comes to like when you're talking about the skilled people that are needed to kind of help get companies to this stage, what do you look for when you're working with companies as far as their internal team makeup from a technical perspective? Are you kind of really hoping companies have people inside that understand the technology or can learn the technology in order to be able to support the deployment once it's kind of out there or is that something that you kind of just assume they're going to be relying on you and maybe your partners to handle well our engineers love it when you have skilled people on the other side right <laughs> and uh, uh, that that's totally awesome but we try to keep technology a bit away from the people and think about what is the use case they want to solve with us how can can we help them with technology but not making technology the subject right so we want to uh, make sure we develop for them, right? And we explain what we do in technology, but we try to keep all the jargon and these things a bit uh, uh, away, right? Because um, uh, our customers are typically good at their use case, right? So we don't understand the industry necessarily they're, they're in, right? Sure. I'm not an expert in healthcare nor in agriculture, right? So right. I need to have their expertise on the use case. Right, and uh, we would then try to bring it together with our expertise on, on technology, right, and work as a uh, as, as an agile team together, right. So we integrate mm. uh, customers in our development process, right. But uh, right. I said more from from the use case side, we try to avoid them needing to think about uh, you know what APIs are and and how devices right. communicate. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes a ton of sense. I think that um, definitely helps speed up the process and not having to rely on them to have a team uh, to support it internally, which I definitely could see being a roadblock. Uh, so so as, as we wrap up here, let me ask you, um, as our audience is listening to this and has questions and, and wants to learn more about um, Akano and, and everything you have going on, what's the best way for them to do that and kind of stay in, stay in touch? Oh, we'd love to get in touch. So any questions, we're always open 24-7 uh, on social media, whether it's uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, right? We have a lot of videos on, on YouTube, right? And... Uh, where we explain use cases and also share details, right? And uh, there's always uh, email and, and, and phone, right? So right. Uh, never hesitate to just uh, reach out. We try to be available. Fantastic. And um, anything new or, or exciting kind of coming out that you're looking forward to this year, whether it's from the company, from the industry in general, that, that our audience can kind of be on the lookout for? Um. Yeah, a couple of things, but one thing that actually makes us uh, quite quite proud, and uh, we are supporting uh, uh, an, an initiative for accessibility and mobility of people uh, who well, who have uh, needs in, in in mobility, right? So mm. uh, we are working on an elevator project that gives like an open map together with the Sozialhelden and others uh, that you can plan your journey. For example, when you're in a wheelchair or in, in other needs, right, to really know your routes and, and whether you can right, right, easily right. get to the train, right, by use of sensors yeah. and 
That's awesome. Uh, that, that's, that's something we find really cool because uh, technology is cool, but if you can combine technology and it helps people in their daily life, yep. uh, that's a very joyful thing. Fantastic. That sounds very exciting. Um, we'll have to definitely stay in, in touch and have you back here when that kind of gets out there um, uh, to have you talk more about it because I think that's super fascinating. Super, super. We'd love to be back with you guys. Right. Fantastic. Well, and, well uh, Thomas, yeah, thanks so much for taking the time. And again, happy early birthday. Um, it's great to have you on. I look forward to doing some more content with you and, and, and the company. I think you have a lot of fascinating things going on and, and it would be exciting to kind of work together. Thank you again for having us. And we'd love to yeah, be more present with you guys because we think it's awesome uh, to see this platform with IoT for All and the work you do. Thank you. All right, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, everyone. Thanks again for watching that episode of the IoT for All podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and be sure to hit the bell notification so you get the latest episodes as soon as they become available. Other than that, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.